Hello there geographers and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to review the seven different urban models that you need to know for your AP Human Geography class. As always, if you find value in these videos, consider subscribing. Now in order for these models to make sense, you have to remember the bid rent theory. So we're going to quickly review it before we get into the model. When looking at the bid rent theory, we can see that as you move farther away from the CBD, the cheaper land gets, which impacts not only the spatial layout of settlements, but the way that land and buildings are used. Use. Places that are closer to the CBD often see more buildings close together, with expansion happening upwards, while places that are farther away from the CBD often expand more horizontally and are more dispersed. Homes that are located farther away from a central business district often have a front yard and a backyard, and access to more green spaces, while homes that are in or near the CBD often do not have space to expand outwards and are more likely to be built on top of one another. This is why it's common to find large apartment buildings downtown and more single-family homes farther away from the city. All of this is because as the population density changes in an area, the cost and availability of land also change. Areas with a high density have less available land and a higher demand for that land, causing the prices to increase. So the closer you get to the CBD, the more likely it is to see large skyscrapers, which have a small lot size but extend vertically. As you move outward from the CBD, you will start to see more manufacturing and warehouses who need access to more land, but also need to be located near the CBD. By locating outside the CBD, these industries are able to get cheaper land and lower rents compared to if they were located inside the CBD. But since they still remain relatively close to the central business district, they remain connected to the businesses and people downtown. Lastly, as we move even farther away from the CBD, we start to see more residential zones, which take advantage of cheaper land and prices and the larger lot size. So we can see that the bid rent theory helps us understand not only the location of different industries, but also different land use patterns as well. If you need more help with understanding how the bid rent theory impacts agricultural land use patterns, the spatial layout of cities, and the density gradient of a city, check out my ultimate review packet for exclusive videos and practice problems to help you in your study. All right, now that we've reviewed the bid rent theory, the time has come to move into the different urban geography models. Starting with the Burgess Concentric Model, which was based on the city of Chicago in the 1920s. In the center we have the CBD, which traditionally consists of different businesses and public and private services. The CBD is surrounded by older homes, with the newest development being located farthest away from the central business district. Lower income residents are typically found in the zone of transition, along with different industries as well. This is unique to cities in the United States. In fact, other countries around the world, it's actually common to have more wealthier residents live near the central business district. As we move outward, we move into the working class homes, which are traditionally traditionally older homes that are occupied by people who are working in the central business district or zone of transition. Next is the better residence zone, which has newer homes that are more dispersed. Here people are more likely to live in a single family home and have a front and backyard. Lastly, there's the commuter zone, which consists of people who live outside the city's limits and commute into the city for work, hence why it's called the commuter zone. Today we can see that parts of this model are becoming outdated due to globalization, changes in the production of different goods and services and due to urban renewal policies and gentrification, all of which are changing not only where people are living and working, but also changing the price of land, spatial patterns in a city, and the land use of different neighborhoods near a central business district. The next model is the Hoyt Sector model, which still uses a CBD as the center point of the model. However, we can see there is a bigger focus here on transportation. Here, a city develops in sectors or wedges, with economic activities being centered around certain sections of the model. This is often based off different economic factors or environmental factors. For example, different industries and businesses will locate near the transportation routes, such as highways or railroads. This allows customers to quickly access the businesses and also allows for the different industries to quickly ship goods in and out of the area. Today, we can see this model has become dated as well due to changes in our transportation system. The CBD just no longer has the same importance as it once did, as more people move to edge cities, boom burbs, and other suburban settlements, all of which has shifted the location of different businesses and industries as more businesses move to be closer to their customers and take advantage of cheaper land prices. Plus, thanks to advancements in personal vehicles, the interstate system, and other transportation methods, goods and people can get between different places quicker and more efficiently, changing not only where people live, but work as well. The next model is the Harrison Allman Multiple Nuclei Model, which was created around 1945. This model 
tries to explain how cities have changed due to advancements in technology and transportation. Unlike the last two models, this model has multiple CBDs. The multiple nuclei model shows a more complex spatial layout with different activities and services gravitating to specific nodes. Each node attracts specific people, businesses, and services and repels other groups and organizations. For example, we can see that the part of a city that has more industrial jobs will often see more people in those jobs live around that area. But that same area will often see less people who work in corporate jobs living near it as they will be more likely to gravitate towards a different node that is closer to their work and lifestyle. The next model we have is the galactic model, also known as the peripheral model, which as a quick side note is just an awesome name for a model. The galactic model. Definitely makes me think of Star Wars. Now this model was developed in the 1960s and looks at a post-industrial city. Here the economy is no longer focused around manufacturing. In fact, it has shifted to be more service-based. The galactic model also accounts for advancements in technology and transportation and accounts for the fact that people now live farther outside of the city's boundaries and can travel into the city thanks to robust infrastructure systems that have been created. For example, we can see that unlike our previous models, this model does acknowledge edge cities, which are located on the outside of the city limits, near or on a beltway or highway. Remember, beltways allow for people to quickly move around the city and surrounding areas. If you do need more help and information on edge cities, beltways, and other settlements, go back and rewatch my unit city topic two video. Now, while it isn't perfect, we can actually see that the city of Atlanta resembles the galactic city model pretty well. When looking at the CBD of Atlanta, we can see a high population density with a clustering of different office buildings, skyscrapers, and other services such as unique restaurants or government buildings. Outside the CBD is different residential areas such as multifamily homes, single family homes, and other suburban residential areas. Atlanta also has industrial zones which are on the outskirts of the CBD. CBD and stretch to the city limits. Here you will find different manufacturing and distribution facilities which are connected by highways and other infrastructure to get goods in and out of the city. Lastly, we can see that the city has a beltway that goes around the entire city, similar to the galactic model. In fact, the city of Atlanta has an extensive network of roadways and highways that allow for people to remain connected, not only to the CBD, but to the other surrounding edge cities and boom burbs that are located on the beltway outside of the Central Business District. So we can see that the city of Atlanta shares a variety of different characteristics with the galactic model. Changing gears now and moving outside of North America and the United States, we have our next model, which is the Latin American city model. This model resembles aspects of the concentric zone model and the sector model. Now, in looking at this model, we can see the impact of European colonization. During the colonial era, many cities were centered around a central plaza or square, which was often surrounded by different governments government buildings and religious buildings. This was because many of the conquistadors believed that God should be in the focus of all society. You can see the influence that Europeans had on cities around Latin America when looking at the spatial layout of different cities. Here we can see the plaza and church at the center of the city. We can also see a grid pattern start to emerge as time went on. Notice how the spatial layout remains fairly consistent even as we look at different cities in different countries. Even today we can see the impact of colonization organization on cities around Latin America. For example, when looking at the capital of Argentina, do you notice the plaza? If we look at the city today, we can still see the spatial layout of a plaza in the city with religious buildings located not far away. In fact, some of the churches near the plaza date all the way back to 1686 and are some of the oldest churches in Buenos Aires. So we can see that historical events such as European colonization had a profound impact on the creation of cities across Latin America. Now, when looking at the model, we can see that the central business district is still located at the center of the model. However, there is a spine extending outwards from the CBD. The spine consists of wealthier residents and high-end commercial activity, often connecting to a commercial sector, also shown here as a mall. Right outside of the CBD, we can see the zone of maturity, which consists of older homes and buildings, and some neighborhoods which may have experienced gentrification. In the peripheral or outer areas of the city, we can see both middle and low-income houses. This 
this area does not have the same access to services as the CBD and the spine do. Lastly, we have the disamenity zone, which consists of residents who are living in extreme poverty. In some cases, these parts of the city will lack basic infrastructure like water, power, or sewage access. We can also see informal settlements, also known as squatter settlements or favelas, forming on the outside of the mob. Unfortunately, these zones have been growing due to increased urbanization rates and a lack of available housing, resources, and capital. All right, now moving from Latin America to Africa, we can observe the Sub-Saharan African city model. Once again, we can see the impact of European colonization, with European colonizers bringing a grid pattern to the urban layout. This model has three distinct CBDs. The first is the colonial CBD, which traditionally is the historic core of the city. Located in this CBD is mixed-use buildings, colonial architecture, multi-story buildings, and narrow street patterns that resemble more of a grid pattern. The second is a traditional CBD, which often consists of different vendors and low-rise buildings with a mix of formal and informal economic activity. Notice as well the grid pattern that we saw in the colonial CBD no longer exists. Lastly, we have the informal CBD or market zone, which consists of informal markets and manufacturing. Now around the CBD, we can see different ethnic neighborhoods and some mixed neighborhoods, which show us that these cities have a history of segregation. Many of the ethnic neighborhoods often have squatter areas and less access to wealth and service compared to the ethnic and mixed neighborhoods. These areas are divided by major roads that stretch across the city, with infrastructure near the city being the most robust. The spatial arrangement of major roads and local streets, as well as the presence of distinct ethnic neighborhoods, are legacies of the colonial era and the continued influence of apartheid. Similar to the Latin American city model, we can see shanty towns and squatter settlements located on the outskirts of the city. These informal settlements continued to expand as countries countries continue to experience a rise in their population due to being located in stage two or three of the demographic transition model. And we continue to see higher rates of urbanization also because there's economic opportunities in these urban areas and people are searching for a better life. Now, last but not least is the Southeast Asian model. And just like Latin American city model and the Sub-Saharan African city model, we can see a mix of the concentric zone model and the sector model. Right away, we can notice that this model does not have a traditional CBD. Instead, the city is based around a port. This is due to a variety of different factors, one of them being the geography of the region. We can see that many of these cities are located on islands or peninsulas. The second factor being that the fact that many of these cities developed as trading posts during the colonial era, with many Western countries coming to trade with these different cities. And the third one being that these areas have experienced rapid urbanization as they've expanded over time. As more manufacturing and industries developed, it was in their best interest to have the center of the city's commerce located at the port, which allowed for goods to quickly come in and out of the city. We can also see the influence of colonial powers and foreign states when looking at this model with the alien commercial zone, which stems from the port and extends inward into the city. These zones were often created to stimulate and promote trade and investment from Western countries. Today, we can see that these areas are sometimes referenced also as special economic zones, a concept we'll talk more about in our Unit 7 video. Traditionally, we can also see government government zones located next to the port and the special economic zone, which allowed the government to be a key player in the city's commerce, cultural, and social activities. Plus, it also allows the government to keep tabs on what is happening in the ports and those special economic zones where foreign commerce is occurring and foreign influence could be happening. Another unique aspect of this model is that many of the residential areas are not separated by socioeconomic class. In fact, we can see suburban areas located right next to squatter settlements. Now, not all of the residents areas are mixed, we can see some parts of the city based around income. However, we do see that newer suburban areas are becoming more mixed. Lastly, we have agricultural production and newer industrial production happening on the outside of the city. All right, now hopefully your head isn't spinning. We just talked about a bunch of different city models and cities around the world. And now comes the time to practice what we've learned. Answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section down below. And if you found value in this video, consider subscribing and supporting the channel. Also, if you do need more help with anything AP Human Geography related, check out my ultimate review packet for a bunch of exclusive resources to help you not only get an A in your class, but a five on the national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time online.